Live from New York, uh, Purdue, more like Purdue. But up, but mayo. John Rothstein joins me to tell me who to root for now that everyone is eliminated from the tourney. And we have new Washington Commanders O lineman, two time Super Bowl champ, Andrew Wiley, on the show. Let's do it. Back in New York City, I thought maybe Aaron Rodgers was here. Maybe I'd help him buy real estate, answer any questions he might have about the New York area, but I've been on good authority. He is not, in fact, in New York. I am, though, my favorite place, 60 degrees, beating L.A. in everything, in sports, in drama, in fun. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about today. John Rothstein is on the show. We'll talk a little tourney, who we should root for, yada, yada, yada. We also have uh, the redemption. <laughs> The redemption of what was a week, we should, we should have it queued up to play. Yesterday's Hamilton Collinsworth slide. Now, we're trying a new way to do it. These aren't chairs you can slide. They have no wheels on them, so I understand the adversity that you were facing, Hamilton, but come on in, Matthew it's Hamilton. a lot of pressure on this. What's up? Okay, that's not bad. I think we have to like move you in more. Scooch, I don't yeah. bite, usually. Uh. Okay, anyway, so we're here. Uh, we've got a lot of things to talk about. We're going to yeah. get into my time at the Knicks game last night. The group chain was, was litty, a as the star children star studded say. Knicks game. It really was. Spike Lee, uh, Fat Joe, our friend Fat Joe oh, from Good Morning go. Football fame. He was yeah. in the building. And yep, that's you, what he's known for. Would you, we'll talk about this later, uh, <laughs> famously on Good yeah. Morning Football one time. Uh, I think I wasn't even there. Or I was there that day. I yeah. remember that day. Uh, do you ever remember things by Instagram? You don't use Instagram stories. My memories and my oh. brain works from Instagram. I mean, I'm picturing the Instagram story and the red font I used to put Fat Joe on my story. Okay. What a time. <laughs> I look like uh, I look like I'm from your. I'm not going to make a comment about what I'm wearing. Oh, no. uh, what do we got today? No um, Aaron Rodgers news. No Aaron Rodgers news yet. We got some interesting comments from Panthers GM Scott Fitterer about Lamar Jackson. Okay. Um, we got you know we're we're gearing up to draft time too. We certainly are. Listen, Deuce Vaughn. Yeah. Retweeted our. Uh, little bit on him yesterday. We're going to do that every day with some draft picks. The one thing that sort of sticks out to us in our show that we want people to know as we sort of count down to what's going to go down in Kansas City, which we might we might go back to Missouri together. That would be fun. Just, I haven't been back since uh, since graduation, so neither have I. Fun. People who go back kind of creep me out. Like, what you, what what brings you back to Columbia, Missouri? Like, you're, you really need to make the uh, the spring for El Rancho and homecoming. I don't really know. Um, what else do we got going? Who else did I see? Oh, but I ran into a bunch of Jets and Giants fans that are like, "What's going on? Who should we like? Should we be Giants fans?" People are trying to like jump ship from one to the other. I thought that was a very interesting conversation in New York. That is, yeah. I mean, I feel like New York fans are usually pretty loyal. I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah. We also, yeah, we have a lot to talk about uh, about that Knicks game experience. I can't wait to get into that. <laughs> the amount of people that are that I didn't. Okay, we'll get into it. Get out of here. We got stuff to get to. Right. Was there anything else we needed to talk about or discuss? Uh, you do your thing. Can you move your chair there, buddy? Yeah. Thank you. you Stage go. crew, chop, chop. <laughs> Let's get to it. Uh, yeah, the Aaron Rodgers uh, saga continues to drag on, but we have other significant news around the league to get to. So let's dig into it. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's been much movement. Hamilton just alluded to it. Lamar, the Ravens, they're on a new deal. We did get our first direct answer from an NFL GM on the decision not to pursue the former at one time MVP. Here's Panthers general manager Scott Fitterer when he was asked whether or not the Panthers considered going after Lamar once the Ravens put that non-exclusive tag on him. You guys ever interested in Lamar? Uh, like anything, like you always have a conversation uh, but uh, we were looking, he's a great option. There's a really expensive option, but uh, we're focused on more of the draft picks at this point. Yeah, like why would we be interested in a guy who's a game breaker, game changer, uh, MVP who hasn't really had a great receiving core to show what he can do with his arm? And like why, like we're the Panthers, why? David Tepper, it's not like he likes to swing for the fences and make bold moves, why would he want to be co-signing that deal? I kind of get the reasoning to an extent, like if you don't feel like you're ready to contend right now, yes, go for a quarterback on a rookie deal and build around him. This is still a tough one for me to digest, because if you think about it this way, 
the Panthers would have to give up two first round picks and a pretty sizable darn contract to get Lamar. Instead, they gave up two first round picks, two second round picks, and their superstar wide receiver for the chance to what? Do the diciest thing in the world and like spin their wheels on a rookie in the draft. It's a pretty expensive price they're paying right there, especially when you consider what a crapshoot situation rookie quarterback. Excuse me, do you notice I go to Vegas for three hours and I'm putting all the Vegas references in there? It's fine. Uh, Ravens, you know, they probably match an offer. That's what I said all along. You're doing all this work and you're doing all these things to say, like, oh, Kelly Kapowski, will you go to the prom with me? Well, you know she's getting back with Zach Morris. You know what I'm saying? Like, why shoot your shot and muster up all that courage and get a haircut and do all of that? Why wear the acid wash jeans to go ask Kelly Kapowski out when you're just, you know, you know what's going to happen at the end of the series. So I understand that. I don't know how that came out of my mouth just now. But it's hard to imagine that a team a la Carolina wouldn't at least want to take a swing for Lamar. We had a conversation about it. What the hell is that? After all, the Panthers and the Falcons, they were willing to give up picks and a big money extension to a certain quarterback that wound up in Cleveland last year, breaking the bank and changing things all around the NFL. So to me, this means one of two things, okay? Either teams are so convinced the Ravens will match that they don't want to raise and crush the hopes of their fan base or you know, impede their resources, what they're doing for free agency a week to get behind other teams every little inch, every little resource matters. I get that. Or scenario two, there is really some larger battle going on over guaranteed contracts. It's just how I feel at this point in the game. So while we're no, clo no closer to either of those answers, and Lamar and the Ravens seem like they're uh, at a bit of a standstill again, and yet uh, there was a detailed report from ESPN that did come out citing a team source who says the Colts in some reverse Mayflower truck situation, which is a great for narrative. I mean, oh my gosh, look at this. Oh my gosh. They could be a player in this, these Colts. Ursay, don't put it past him. I think this would be a fantastic fit with the support system he has there, including a new head coach in Shane Steichen after seeing the offense he designed around Jalen Hurts. Marissa, cover your ears. I know it still hurts you. But Jim Ursay, he doesn't follow a crowd. You think Jim Ursay... Like, this is, the, this is the Jim Ursay experience. Everyone's sort of being tiptoe around this. I'm going to make things really interesting. I'm indie. I want to bounce back. I made some um, unconventional, not popular decisions before, even in the last six months or so. So I could see them doing this. And of all the teams, Hamilton, for the Ravens to have this sort of, like, muck going on with, for it to be the cult is sort of a beautiful war. Yeah, there's a lot of scar tissue there. I don't think Baltimore would respond well to that happening, and you stole our team, and now you're yeah. going to steal our star But they at least have the comfort food in Jimmy Seafood to lean on in these trying times that's, down that's there true. in Baltimore. As look at that picture. Who calls yeah. it Baltimore? Brian Billick. Yeah. Baltimore, okay? Call it Baltimore. It's not Baltimore. Call it Baltimore, okay? Eat crab uh, cakes and look at pictures of K on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's move on to Detroit, people. The Lions. They've had themselves an exciting offseason. There's this LOL Lions or like the, the Kelvin Johnson thing in the end is the most Lion thing ever. You can't say that anymore, you losers. On Sunday night, they landed former Eagle C.J. Gardner-Johnson. That was the top DB left on the market. And if nothing else, he brings a whole new level of confidence to try to help change this thing around. We're talking bottom of the barrel. You could not have done worse than their defense last year. Take a listen to his press conference yesterday when asked how he views himself and his role in the Motor City. In Jalen Ramsey's words, him. Uh, I'm playing. I just feel like uh, when you get the chance to do multiple things, you don't just you're not limited to one. You can just really express your football personality more than talk about what you can do. So I think when I got the chance to go play nickel, I'm gonna dominate nickel. I got a chance to go play safety, I'm gonna dominate safety. So I think no matter where you put me, it's gonna it's gonna go on. It's gonna go down all game. For me to pay attention to what he's saying and not what his ridiculous sweatshirt is, which I love all those random things on, he has to really be saying something. You could frame that press conference and put it in the Louvre because that's pretty much everything you could hope for out of Mr. CJ in front of the cameras and the microphones there in Detroit. But in all seriousness, I have to give the Lions some love for what they've done to overhaul the defense and add some serious talent to the roster this offseason. It's not just CJ. With what was it, like a chainsaw? 
a pair of scissors. Was it rock, paper, scissors? scissors on? Okay, got it. Sure, sure, that makes sense. They added David Montgomery to the backfield. Hamilton, you know how I feel about him. Yeah, he's, he's got a lot. If he can stay healthy, he's another guy. Like, when he's healthy, he runs so hard, and he's going to be a great addition. And he wants to be great. He always has. Now, he, they also snag Cameron Sutton away from the Steelers, Niners corner Emmanuel Mosley as well. And on top of that, they're two. Tormentor Aaron Rodgers is out the building. He's on his way out of the division. The Vikings have suffered some serious cap casualties. They get rid of uh, Eric Hendricks, had to say bye to him. They write a postcard and send Adam Thielen out the door, the local boy. And don't forget, they also have two first-round picks to play with. Mm, 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 mm. Isn't that home improvement based in Michigan? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. The sixth overall pick courtesy of the Rams, and their own 18th overall pick. So it's too early, and yes, we should take some time with this one, but I am... <clears throat> I am really, and Chicago fans, oh, I'm really heavily at this point in March leaning towards picking the Lions to win their first division title since 1993, when, home, when Jonathan Taylor Thomas posters were on my wall in a in a one-bedroom, <laughs> two-bedroom house with seven people living in it in Chicago. So that's literally the vibe. I can I, see that. I went with posters of Wilson on, well, posters, on my That's wall. what you yeah. had? Yeah, you yeah. liked the plaid shirts and the fish bucket hats really did it for you. <laughs> I was more of an Al Borle. I mean, a nor Conrad Heidi, obviously. We can, we can do this. We could do this <laughs> really easily. Finally, the Texans of all teams have made a serious splash over the last couple of days. I love that phrase, a serious splash. They're making a splash. Yesterday afternoon, they lure star tight end Dalton Schultz away. We're just asking this. Just yesterday, we were talking about Dalton Schultz. He gets snatched from the Cowboys. One year deal, how much? Up to $9 million. That's pretty good, no? Yeah, it's not bad. Oh, it, it sounds like there might have been some more on the table, and he kind of gambled to go to free agency and didn't work out. But, it's, but again, one-year deal. It's a lot of money in one year, and he can hit the market again next year. Good for the Texans. They also yeah. get Devin Singletary, who we like. That was a one-year deal. So that's a little, like, one-two situation, him and Damian Pierce. They were sort of used to that down in the Texans, if they can reinvigorate that. And, y you know, they have Nick Casari. I'm still waiting for him to, like, really turn it around. You know, his legacy up there in New England was epic. But did he do, you know... Was it, how much of that was Brady? How much of that was Belichick? How much of that was Brady taking a pay cut that made it so much easier, so much easier for him to put those things together? Like Nick Casario is sort of an interesting figure that nobody talks about, and he's doing things very quietly, but he's putting, and people should pay attention to it more, a solid foundation in place for whichever quarterback they end up snagging. They have a number two overall pick. As it stands now, things can change. But if you look at everything they've done quietly, as Casario always does it, very under the radar this year, there's an influx of talent on the offense. Bobby Woods... Uh, Noah Brown, who else do they got, Hammy? Shaq Mason in that trade from, from Tampa, obviously someone Casario's familiar with from his time in New England. Sheldon Rankins from the Saints, Jimmy Ward from the Niners. That's a ton of talent on that full screen right there. It's not bad. Well, they had a top 10 pass defense last year, so that sort of helps that. So they still need some uh, fixes for some of the holes they have. They need a number one wide receiver. Whoever that quarterback ends up being isn't going to be in the worst situation in the NFL, like a lot of people think. Like, it's not that it's that number two pick vibe, but it's it's okay. And this is just the beginning. They have 12 picks in this draft. They've got five in the first. Five, five in the first three rounds is insane. They could change their entire course of their future with this. And then they have the number two uh, overall, like we just talked about. They have the Browns. 12th overall pick as well. So it might not come together in 2023. But if you're drafting a young quarterback, it's one of those things like, is is this the team to really look at? And nobody wants to believe it. Oh, some people I think would say like, the Texans have a better shot than the Cowboys. Like people are so down on the Cowboys. It's crazy what that looks like. But there's some things setting, the table is being set at the party that could be in Houston. And Casario, we see you, and, and, and I don't think we talk about you enough. All right, we've got a wily Washington commander coming up, offensive lineman on the program. Look at these graphics. What's going on? Andrew Wiley! <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. They're getting iced. Shout out to Smirnoff. That doesn't look like Smirnoff ices, though. Who knows? I bet our next guest doesn't even know what he was drinking in this. 
Yeah, doesn't seem like it. He spent the last five seasons playing on the O-line for the Kansas City Chiefs. He's fresh off dominating the Philadelphia Eagles to win. This is amazing. His second Super Bowl, and he just inked a three-year contract with the Washington Commanders. Please welcome Andrew Wiley to the show. Andrew, hi. Hey, how we doing, guys? Amazing, and I will say that my producer in my ear right before we came back from commercial said, he's in a really good mood, and I'm like, you think? <laughs> You think yeah, he's in a, in a good, good mood? mood because he just, yeah. yeah, he just got paid. He's got a whole new energy about him, but you also just won two Super Bowls. How good is life for you right now? Man, it's great. It's, uh, you know, it's been a great season um, leading up to the off season. So i uh, just been having a, a great time. <laughs> Absolutely blessed. And, uh, you know, just finally getting back into the swing of things, starting to work out again. But, you know, it's, it's been great. Are you, Andrew, are you really starting to work out again? I wouldn't work out until the <laughs> ring ceremony. Once I get the, the second <laughs> ring, then I'll start working out. Yeah, no doubt. It was it was only my second workout, though, so it's not like I've been going too crazy yet. <laughs> That's what I like. How does it compare to the first one? You're in this rare, truly, like truly rare company of somebody who's gotten to the pinnacle of the sport, the greatest to ever do it, the greatest, uh, twice. How does it compare to that first one? Um, you know, this one means a little bit more to me personally, um, you know, playing every game this year, getting all those starts and then, um, you know, continuing the run through playoffs all the way up to the Super Bowl and then actually getting to get out there and compete myself. Um, so this one truly means the world to me, uh, personally it carries a little more weight, but, um, but you know, it's just be a two time world champion. There's nothing better. <laughs> it's so true. Two rings here. And, you know, when you talk about it, meaning a little bit more to you, you were, the only guy, unless you can tell me differently, I think you're the only guy on that O-line that was the holdover from when you guys lost to the Bucks in Super Bowl 55, not to bring that up, sorry. So I would imagine this run has to be super special to you. You personally dominating in the AFC Championship win over the Bengals and then in the Super Bowl. Like, how, how does it feel coming off a loss knowing what that's like? Yeah, um, you know, it took a lot to, you know, to get that, get that stink off the shoulder, you know. Um, so, you know, we, we carried that ship. Uh, for a long time, there there was a, there was a few of us that were there, uh, just a couple couple of the guys, but um, from that from that loss in that Super Bowl, but um, but I was the only one out there uh, um, playing. But um, yeah, it's, it's it's truly special, you know. It, you know, it's not an easy path. Uh, there's a lot of games in a season, and uh, you know, yeah. it, was, it was a fight for every single one of those. But you know, just just the hell of a playoff run, um, you know, by me and the guys, and it was a lot of fun this year. Andrew, we media nerds love to talk about, oh, like a Super Bowl loss. It's hard to come off of that. It's hard. How, you're saying it took a lot of work. It was a journey to get that off of your shoulder, out of your head. How did you do it? Man, I just, uh, you know, luckily, uh, you know, I got some great friends and great teammates in the locker room that I was in, um, you know, just some lifelong guys and uh, guys that were out there with me too. So, uh, you know, we kind of rallied together. You know, we, we know, um, you know, the finer details of what went down and, uh, we rallied together and worked harder than we ever had before. So, um, you know, it worked out for us. You spent so much time in Kansas City. I, I bet it was bitter, bittersweet having to leave. Of course, you win two Super Bowl championships there. And your story and journey there in itself is great, right? You go from practice squad, practice squad to starter to Super Bowl champion. So how would you say you grew as a player and maybe even as a person during that time in Kansas City? Yeah, well, you know, from being there for for five, five years, uh, you know, did a lot of growing, um, you know, just maturing, um, you know, off the field, but, um, but a lot of, you know, I would say, you know, majority of, of the success that I've had is, is just due to the coaching staff that was there. Um, you know, Andy Heck being um, one of the, a great offensive line coach and, and a great mind for the game truly taught me how to, um, start playing offensive line essentially in the NFL and then to, to grow into the player that I am. Um, so just the coaching staff that was there, uh, you know, Brad Beach, our GM, uh, you know, bringing me in yeah. and giving me that chance and, uh, you know, just, you know, big red um, dialing it up. So, you know, just just an incredible group of guys um, and coaching staff really, really helped uh, propel my career. And you're such a professional Super Bowl parade champion we saw that video coming in if we can even roll it again what advice would you give like let's say the commanders win 
the Super Bowl this year and you're giving advice to guys on like how to handle this in this mean streets of DC, <laughs> what's the advice you would give in maybe pacing yourself or just that piece of advice you'd give to the future Super Bowl champions? Pacing yourself is incredibly important. Uh, um, I would say <laughs> just like that, man, just like that video, get out uh, and get active with the crowd, man. I would love nothing more than to interact with the fans, especially. Um, you know, and some, some of the highest points of, of my life. And so, you know, the fans toughing it out with you all season, um, all those games showing up, being loud, supporting. And, uh, you know, it's truly something to just get out there in the streets and, and have a drink with a fan, man. It is, it's truly, a, you know, it, it's an incredible experience. One of the happiest days I've ever had. What's the best moment of winning a Super Bowl? So now you've had two. So now I'm just, I'm really thinking about this. Because to me, the parade is sort of the underrated part because it's like not on the field, but it's you've, you've, granted you haven't slept in days, I'm sure, but you must feel like an absolute superhero, like a superhero out there in front of all these people and that must be so rewarding and validating and just fun. From, from the moment you realize that you win the Super Bowl to maybe the, the day that the season starts that next year or next season, what is the single moment that, is the, that feels the actual best? Um, I don't, so my personal favorite is, you know, just getting my family down on the field when the confetti's falling. Um, that's something that constantly, uh, plays in my head. Um, I don't think the actual weight of what happened, uh, has hit yet, um, during that point. Um, but it is yeah. just truly something special to, to be there on the field, uh, see mom pops and, uh, and, you know, just see the confetti falling with them. You know, everyone's crying, having a great time. Um, but it's just it, that feeling is truly something special. And, uh, you know, I'll remember that forever. Wait, so when does it hit you? Um, I would say it hits, um, once we, you know, once we always get back to the city and, you know, it usually hits when I go out, um, you know, usually go out for dinner on the town or something. And it's just, the town is just has a different sort of energy about it. Um, you know, that championship energy. And so. Um, you know, you kind of look around and it hits you like I was a part of this. Uh, we did this, you know, this community did this. And um, yeah, it took a few days, but um, but that's when it hit me. We'd love to hear that. And, uh, my producer is telling me we have a funny tweet he wants to show you. I don't know if I trust that it'll actually be funny, but here it is. Oh, this is from you. Anyway, who's showing up to this parade tomorrow? I'm trying to chug some beers with you all. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. And, and that's what I did. And uh like I said, man, there's, there's just nothing better than getting out with the fans who have been riding with you for so long, um, such an yeah. incredibly long season. And, uh, and, they, and, you know, and the fans, they're, they're there through it all. They're going, going through it with you. So, you know, it's truly something to, to have that level of interaction um, is very rare. So, you know, I enjoy every minute of it, every ounce of it. Uh, with <laughs> your smile. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, your smile says it all, and I'm so happy for you. Stop working out. You can say that. I'm sure Ron Rivera, blah, he won't see this. Like, just live your life. Have your, live your best time. It's so crazy that you talk about Super Bowls. Like, yeah, you know, you go back to the city. and they, Like, you, it's happened to you twice. It's so incredible. And we want to talk about the commanders and how you're going to bring that Super Bowl mentality to this new city that so desperately needs that sort of invigoration. But before we do that, you got to talk me through this play, okay? Talk to me. Just... I'm going to show you some video here. What were you thinking when you practiced this for the first time? Man, I was thinking about how I'm going to ice the game and, and win the Super Bowl for my team. <laughs> That's all I was thinking. Um, um, man, I wish I, uh, you know, really wish I could have uh, got open and, uh, and and made that play go. Uh, this one, um, this one against the Raiders, though, we uh, we got a little razzle dazzle going, a little. Uh, little snow globe <laughs> and uh but you know that's just that's something we dial up when we're having fun uh you know when we were having fun at walkthroughs on saturdays just just having fun and, and pat's usually dialing up something and then you know eb got a hold of it and he really likes it and so you know then coach reed's like well screw it man put it in the playbook let's uh let's get it dialed up and uh that's the natural progression but uh you know in the super bowl you know i really thought i really thought i was going to come down with a touchdown <laughs> and, um, you know, sorry to the sorry to the guys. I couldn't make it happen. I couldn't get out clean on my release. That, that's my bad. Um, but, yeah, so I was I was thinking all glory <laughs> when that play got called. All, yeah, exactly. We're, we're not even bringing that up. But uh, th you're saying we just dialed it up and we're having we do it when we're having fun. Andrew, that is so disrespectful. <laughs> like, it's so disrespectful <laughs> to the Raiders.
<laughs> no, it was uh, so that play. You know, it's not like it was. It was you know a play for the Raiders. You know that the play like that needs to be in the playbook for about a month uh, before you can even think about uh, putting it up for the week. Um, and so uh, yeah, we practiced it for a month or two, doing the ring around the rosy and. Uh, you know, never really screwed it up too bad to get it uh, taken out the playbook. So, you know, they dialed it up. I was a little surprised uh, and it worked. So, you know, that's all she wrote. <laughs> You're like, I got a job to do. Here I am. Ring around the posy. It's out. Ring around the rosy. It sounds good. OK, you're wearing that Washington yeah. Commander shirt, which I I love. And Kansas City mm-hmm. loves you and they will always love you because you are a legend, a two time Super Bowl champion. And now you're with a new squad, a new head coach in Ron Rivera, but a very familiar guy in Eric Bieniemy, the OC there. What was free agency like for you and what ultimately led to your decision? And really, what did Eric play in that? Yeah, well, you know, I got. Um, you know, so much thanks and so much praise for, for Coach EB, um, you know, speaking on my behalf, really fighting for me to get in that building. Um, you know, so that means the world to me. And, you know, and I'm ready to fight for that guy. And, you know, just like we have been for the last five years together. Um, but it happened pretty quick, you know, because I did this whole free agency thing last year. And uh, it took a little while. Um, you know, the money dries up pretty quick. And so I uh, ended up just signing a one-year deal last year. But, you know, this free agency was a little different. I was, uh, you know, me and my agent kind of went back and forth. And, you know, we thought we were going to get something done in the second week. Uh, but then he shows up at my spot here on the first day on Monday with uh, with a few offers. And so that was that was really cool to be a part of. And then the fact that, <laughs> uh, you know, D.C. came in, came in with a little bag there. So, you know, me and him, uh, you know, just... <laughs> Um, couldn't be more thankful to my agent, man. Beck, he really, um, you know, fought for us and, and got it done. And now I'm just, I'm so stoked to get in that building. Um, had some really great interactions with with the head coach Rivera, and, and obviously EB, and then just meeting meeting all the guys around that building. So um, I had a great day there, great signing, and I'm just so excited to to get down there for OTAs and get after it a little bit. What do you know that the enemy will bring into the table? He's sort of this enigma. I think everyone wants him to be a head coach, thinks he could do the job as a head coach. It hasn't happened for him. He takes this job under Ron Rivera. What is the maybe like the most important quality of his coaching style or him, him as a man that he'll bring into that building? Yeah, he's just he has this commanding energy about him. Uh, he truly takes control of the room. Uh, he commands respect uh, when he talks. Uh, and he's very intense. Um, but you know, he truly believes in what he's preaching. And, uh, and I feel like, uh, you know, everybody in that room gets that sense right away. So, um, it's just that commanding energy that he carries with them every minute of the day. It's, uh, it's, it's pretty inspiring. So. I love that. Are you surprised he's not a head coach? Uh, he definitely uh, has some strong head coach qualities, uh, you know, and I know that he's been interviewing for a while and, um, you know, I think his future is 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 on an upward path, uh, no doubt. And I think, uh, you know, what we're about to do here in Washington D.C. in the next three years is going to be something special. And so that will that'll only help yeah. uh, his resume. I love that. I Absolutely. feel like you're going to help uh, do that. Where are you play? You play, you play all over the line. You're super versatile. If you could pick, or do you have any idea where they're going to put you or where you want to be? Um, you know, that's all up, all up to the higher ups. Uh, honestly, I'll, I'll do whatever they ask of me. You know, I just, I truly enjoy, uh, the offensive line position as a whole. Um, <laughs> you know, I got experience at pretty much everything but center. So, you know, if, if they, uh, if they leave me out of the center talks, I won't be bad, but anything else is, is, is all good. <laughs> Andrew, this is why you got that bag that you're talking about, because you were the perfect employee. You were the perfect teammate. You're gassing up your OC. You love your head coach. You'll play and do whatever they want you to. It's amazing. Uh, and I love it. Now, I also, I heard, uh, I, I'm, I am, am friendly with Michael Rubin, and he's really into these cards and this, you know, he he's taking over the mint condition card vibes and games or whatever collectibles. You're really big into that. And I'm just learning oh, yeah. about it. You, you, as I understand, have a mint condition LeBron James rookie card, which is that true? Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. Where is it in your house? Is it more valuable to you than your Super Bowl ring? Like where do you hold it in, in terms of like your importance of prized possessions? Um, that is, it's my most prized card. It's not my most valuable, I don't think, but you know, there's a little story behind it. Um, quick one, you know, me and my dad, we started collecting cards, uh, you know, when I was living at home, young age, and 
And he actually picked that up, you know, a few years after, you know, LeBron's rookie year for, you know, 25 bucks. Wow. And then just sat sat in the safe or sat in a drawer or whatever uh, for, for about 20, you know, 15, 20 years, whatever. And so I finally got back into cards a few years ago and I was like, dang, this thing's pretty nice. And, and we sent it in and it got a got a perfect grade on it. And so um, that's kind of just a cool story about, you know, the first time when I started collecting all the way to now. Um, but I feel I feel like uh, the Super Bowl stuff would be uh, be a little little bit above that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a good answer. But I mean, is this card, I would say this card is worth like 500 bucks. What is it? Is it worth much more than that? No, I mean, it's nothing crazy. Um, you know, and okay. the thing with the card market, it's always up and down. So it's really hard to put a, okay. put a number on it, especially since it's something I would never personally sell. But, um, yeah. but it's, it's a little more than $500, but nothing too crazy. Okay, it just means something to you personally, which I love. Okay, I know you're a big, and thank you for mm -hmm. teaching me that. Uh, you're a big video game guy as well, so I'm sure, you know, everybody's, all the rage is The Last of Us, and that's on, you know, on, on TV now or streaming or whatever. So we're going to play a game based off the HBO series and video game. It's called The Last of You. It's the last thing we're doing, and it's a rapid-fire style questions. about the kind of like the last time you did something or the last thing you've done? Okay, who was the last teammate that you, who you texted? Former or current? Uh, former, I would say it was, it was my guy, Mitchell Schwartz. Uh, I gave him a text yesterday. Um, and so that's my guy, Mitchell Schwartz. Mm -hmm. Mitchell Schwartz, he watches all the games at home on his Lazy Boy. He told me that on my show. Okay. What's yeah. the last movie or TV show that you watched? Last night, and this is an all timer. It's probably in my top five is SWAT. You ever uh, see, see that movie? It's no. always on FX. No. And you got to fight through the commercials because it was just on TV. But that, that's an all-timer right there. Every time it's on TV, I'll put it on. You're sitting there watching SWAT on regular TV with commercials. Andrew Wiley, that is the best thing I've ever heard. When is the last <laughs> time you bought a pair? When's the last time you bought a pair of shoes? Uh, last night, I bought some. I bought some Jordan golf shoes. Man, I'm trying to get my golf swag up. So uh, I got the clubs. Uh, you know, I got the fit. Now I just I need some I need some Jordans out there. So I got some Jordan sixes and some uh, some twelves. Sounds like a Super Bowl <laughs> champions off season. I like it. When is what is the last chain <clears throat> restaurant you ate at? Um, you know, there's one down the street here in Florida called Charlie's. I think it's a chain. Uh, but it's a nice steakhouse. Yep, had a, had a nice steak and oh, a glass Charlie's? of wine. So, yeah. I don't. I, don't, I, I could have that, another word at the end of it. Yeah, I think it's a chain. Though. I think <laughs> it's a chain. That counts. Oh, Charlie Houlihan's. It's all the same. Okay. When's the <laughs> last time you bought something that you were like, "Oh my gosh, why did I buy this? I spent too much money on this." You had buyer's remorse. When's the last time? Oh, that's tough uh, because, you know, I like I like getting out there shopping. But I would probably say, you know, when we were in Arizona uh, for the Super Bowl, they had some very nice shopping centers around there. And I probably bought bought a hoodie at a store that I didn't need to. Um, but, you know, it's going to look good, but I, I probably won't wear it over 10 times. One of those things. <laughs> Andrew Wiley likes shopping, spent his Super Bowl week shopping in Arizona, which I love. And he's the one who watches SWAT. I was always wondering who watches SWAT. And here he is, Andrew Wiley. Good luck in Washington. Congratulations on the bag, which means you never have to have buyer's remorse. And all blessed things and uh, just good vibes to you going forward. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, we appreciate you, and congratulations. Two-time Super Bowl champion Andrew Wiley will be back after this. John Rothstein, what happened to Purdue? This is March. Uh, don't ask and you shall receive. We need to talk to John Rothstein, part of our FanDuel family, co-host of College Hoops Today podcast, insider for CBS Sports, and a man who loves March more than anything. We need our weekly dose of Rothstein. I, listen, you came on. I was so into it. I got so excited. What happened to Purdue? The NCAA tournament happened to Purdue. And Kay, pound for pound, inch for inch, there was no bigger upset in the history of the NCAA tournament than what Fairleigh Dickinson did to Purdue last week. Now, here's the catch. When you think about great upsets in the history of the NCAA tournament, you think about UMBC obviously beating Virginia. You think about St. Peter's beating Kentucky last year. But here's the difference. FDU was filled with D2 transfers, and FDU started playing the NCAA tournament in the first four. Those two other teams that pulled upsets didn't. And beyond that, FDU did not 
play in a situation where it earned an automatic qualifier to the NCAA tournament by winning the Northeast Conference tournament. Wow. It lost to Merrimack, but because Merrimack was ineligible to play in the NCAA tournament, FDU went into the tournament by default. Okay, remember, it's not anarchy. It's just college basketball. It's just, you know, and you, your answer is this is March. And I just want you to know that I just decided I'm going to adopt that as my fail safe get out of anything card for the rest of my life. This upcoming At season, when I say, month. well, no, 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 <laughs> when, when, you know, in, in, in January when the J Jets are flailing and I pick them to win the AFC East, my answer, okay, you're an idiot. You say, I'll say this is March. This is Funny. like anytime Darn I get it. something wrong. I love, I love that. But listen, this FDU thing. Is, you know, you said, the thing that you said on my show and that you nailed home was that there's more parity in this tourney mm -hmm. than in anyone in the past. And I thought you were being maybe a little hyperbolic, a little excited since you love the tournament so much. But this FDU thing, it's the Cinderella stuff that dreams are made of here. So outside of them, who are the other underdogs that need to be looking at that might upset further in the tourney? Well, I want to add to that FDU thing a little bit here because I reported a couple of minutes ago on Twitter, probably about 35 minutes ago, that Tobin Anderson, the head coach of FDU, has informed FDU that he is leaving to take the head coaching vacancy <gasps> at Iona, which was obviously open yesterday when Rick Pitino left to take the St. John's news. So the Tobin Anderson kind of trajectory continues to be upward. And to answer your question, when you look at the potential upsets in this NCAA tournament moving forward, we have different themes to each region. And we talked about this when the brackets came out. On the top left, we have the region of opportunity. Alabama yes. never been to a Final Four. At San Diego State has not been to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament since 2014. And then we have Creighton. Obviously, very formidable team out of the Big East against Princeton, a team that lost Jalen Llewellyn to Michigan, Ethan Wright to Colorado, but is still in position now to win its third NCAA tournament game this week. You now look at the bottom left of your bracket, the region of misdirection, and with good reason when you think about what's happened. FAU, led by Dusty We Sleep in May, was set to be the darlings of this NCAA tournament, but FAU ran up against FDU in the round of 32 they play tennessee and then we've got kansas state against michigan state in the sweet 16 at madison square garden and you know the deal with michigan state k when you set your calendar yeah. there is no march it's january february Izzo, april it's it's very true i once my brother went to michigan state so i actually that's the one team that i know very well i went to a football game at notre dame when i was 18 i had a bunch of well underage cocktails i guess i shouldn't say that out loud but i ran across notre dame because i saw izzo and he had nine security guards around him and i somehow finessed my way and got a selfie before selfies were even things so izzo is somebody who's got the experience he'll get it done and they're going to take down kansas state that's who i would say i'm riding into this next week the sweet 16 situation with because of that experience but all the guys I like the OGs are out Marquette I was a Golden Eagle gal I told you Memphis I thought I was gonna root for Memphis Mizzou my alma mater they're all out is there a team you can let me adopt for the sweet ride well that's I, you know a hard question when you've got 16 compelling storylines I think the yeah. story at Texas K is fascinating for a number okay. of reasons you know Texas had an in-season coaching change these players came to play for Chris Beard. He was removed as Texas's head coach in the middle of the season. And Rodney Terry, the interim head coach, who has not been named the permanent head coach yet, although he should, has taken Texas to incredible heights. Now, what do I mean by that? Texas had only won one Big 12 tournament title prior to the season. Rodney Terry won the Big 12 tournament title. And Rodney Terry beat Kansas twice in the final week of the regular season. Once in Austin, once in the Big 12 tournament. Texas had not been to the second weekend of the NCAA tournament since 2008. Texas is back in the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2008 in terms of the second weekend. So you have somebody who is not the permanent head coach of this program, but is taking this wow. program to brand new heights. And I think it's a great lesson, not just for college basketball or college sports, but also but for life. You know, you can't control what happens to you, but you can control how you respond. 
and when that's the case, and like the coaching clearly matters. We just talked about Tom Izzo. We talked about FDU and that, um, ha, you know, him taking another job. You just reported that news on Twitter because you're amazing and all over it. How will that affect a team like FDU? Like, how much do, is it one of those things where they're going to rally and play harder for him, knowing that, you know, all of these teams know that they're not going to be the same year to year. That's why something yeah. like Tom Izzo is so impressive uh, to me because he continues to get his teams to play on a high level. I think we're in a state right now with college basketball and college sports that if you are able to build a program and keep a program Mm. together, you are now the exception. You are not the rule. With immediate eligibility via the transfer portal, you are going to see teams being built on an annual basis. The program builders and the guys who can keep programs will be the exception, not the rule. FDU is obviously a school that had an incredible run a week that it will never remember, but now they have to find somebody to replace Tobin Anderson, who again led FDU to the biggest upset in the history of the NCAA tournament. But this is something that happens, you know, we see it every spring. People get opportunities to move on and change their lives monetarily. Tobin Anderson is the latest. Mm-hmm. John, are you sleeping? No, we sleep in May. But you really don't, right? I'm a little, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a little worried about you. I know you're in New York. You're getting said. What is your sleep? What is your sleep schedule like? Is it just adrenaline purely for the next month? I think you just kind of say to yourself that you're not going to be in a situation where you get any sleep really consistently until you get back from the Final Four, and you have to hope, for all intents and purposes, that you know when you land from the airport on. On, on April, excuse me, on April fourth. See, I'm still not sleeping, so I'm, I'm getting my months mixed up. That all the head coaching <laughs> jobs, that all the head coaching jobs are filled. That's what I hope. That when I leave on that early morning flight on the Tuesday after the national championship game, that all the news is done, that everything is kind of taken care of, and then you can kind of look forward to next season in the spring. You are crushing it, and so we appreciate just the time that we have here. And you've also got quite the personal brand, Mr. Rossi. We talked about it last week, uh, the isms on the show, and I think we got a new one about Miami this week. I need to know who is making your sayings into merch and how they are doing this at such a rapid clip. What is going on? Do you have a workshop with elves? Well, you know, I have folks in the lab that, you know, work on different things periodically based on the projects, but... You know this because you are obviously entrenched in media and, you know, we're in the same business. When there are people who are non-players and non-coaches and they're not in a hosting type role, usually the theme is, well, you know, you've got to obviously be a writer. You've got to be in the news space. You've got to obviously then try to pair that with something on the air and television. But I kind of learned, you know, years ago that that's all important and you want to bring things from a news perspective to forward stories. But, you know, if you do that and you take that route, you are just going to be looped in with every, everybody else. I never want to do anything from a branding perspective that is remotely yes. close to everybody else. I want to be my own person and my own entity. So people gravitate towards taglines. People gravitate towards things that they're not getting anywhere else. And my whole thought process is to always be nothing but authentic because if you compare that yes. with everything else that comes with not being a player, not being a coach, you know, you'd like to think that you have some long-term potential. And it's one of the hardest things to do to remain authentic. And the thing I love about your Rothstein tweets turned into T-shirts is it's not you pushing it. I don't think it's about you creating a brand or sitting down and having a meeting. I mean, you're hardly sleeping covering this thing. It's your fan base taking it and making it happen for you. So we went back all the way in time to 2009, and that's when you first created your Twitter wow. account. We did some research. So we're going to play a little game of, did I tweet that with John oh, Rothstein? Wow. I'm going to show you three mock-up oh. T-shirts Two have fake sayings on them, and one will have a saying that you actually tweeted at some point in time, and you have to decide which one you think came from your brain. All right, let's take a look at the first uh, T-shirts here. Did you say, mo money, mo problems? Did you tweet, ain't nothing but a G thing? Did you tweet straight out of Cameron? (laughs) I used to tweet when I was in my, I would say, more party phase in my mid-20s to late 20s when mo money, mo problems would come on like late, like between 12, 30 and 2, wherever I was at. I would tweet mo money, mo problems, the elite hip hop song of the 1990s. Is that right? Aren't you producers going to have to tell me, man? 
Well done, Chris Broussard. I love hip hop. 90% of what I listen to, best hip hop ain't on radio nowadays. All right, well done. Good start here. Let's go. You're entering the Sweet 16 tourney here with our game. Let's take a look. Bacon Supremacy, Mac and Cheese Madness, Lost Count After Eight Chocolate Chip Cookies. Which one did you tweet? It was definitely Lost Count After Eight Chocolate Chip Cookies. <laughs> you a sweets guy? Uh, well, I pick and choose my spots, you know what I mean? Because it's like, remember that Pringles commercial, you can't have just one? My willpower <laughs> is really, really good, but if I start, I can't stop. Like right now, I'm on a high-protein diet with just really protein shakes and grilled chicken. Well, that sounds really boring, but the sugar high will get you through May, uh, March, that's for sure, into May and April. All right, let's do it. Last one for you. What's a subtweet? How do you work this thing? I don't even know how to change my avatar. I'm a little bit of a loss for words right now for the first time in almost four decades. I would maybe say I don't even know how to change my avatar. You got me? Let's say I don't know the answer. Let's take a look. Yeah! There we go. There you have it, world. There are some ideas for you, for your for your brand, for everybody to have these on their t-shirt. It's so cool to be watching March Madness and for it to go and have people. I'm watching people tweet Instagram and I'm seeing it everywhere. It's amazing. You're catching fire and so is March Madness, of course. Uh, you can catch you uh, covering everything for CBS Sports. Your podcast, guys, listen to College Hoops today. Uh, and, and you know, I'm going to get you to drink a coffee by the end of this thing. That's what my, my personal goal is. All right. I have to ask you a question, though, because I, I forgot to yeah. ask it the last time we visited were you named after diane keaton's character in the godfather i've never even seen the godfather no i wasn't oh but say, it's a something hey, i know it's you're, something you're, I get you're asked. admitting on your own show that you hate fun <laughs> there is nothing better when college basketball kind of wraps up and it's done on a sunday to watch the godfather one and two and then go to campagnola for dinner i mean that's a sunday I sat at a Knicks game last night next to a guy that's in The Sopranos who's really famous and I had no idea who he was. So I need to get on my mobster movies. I will tell you, I will, I will watch The Godfather and do a movie review before I see you next. Before we next talk, I will watch The Godfather. All right, The Godfather epic though, which is Godfather one and two, like, you know, in chronological order, because there's a prequel in The Godfather okay. part two. That's like seven hours. So, I mean, you better you better hope that it snows really soon. So you're inside and you gotta, you've got time to fill. But it, it'll, it'll change I'll your life. I'll watch it. Okay, I'll watch it while I pay attention to Texas, which is my team entering the Sweet 16. We appreciate you, John Rothstein. Get some sleep and get a cookie. Get some, uh, some Mike and Ikes, get some Pixie Sticks, get that sugar going to keep you alive and well for CBS Sports. Big thanks to Andrew Wiley and John Rothstein. Uh, Gronk tomorrow. Tank Bigsby from Auburn. How amazing is that? We also have Kareem Jackson of the Broncos. I will find out from Sean Payton what we should ask him. It's all tomorrow.